Welcome to the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon, and a tricky one to understand. Why so much detail about olive trees? Well, Jacob wasn't just trying to branch out into symbolism, he's actually quoting the ancient prophet Zenos, who masterfully teaches the history and story of the house of Israel with olive trees. Using parables and allegories, ancient Hebrew prophets like Zenos and Isaiah could vividly convey multiple layers of truth with everyday examples that people were very familiar with. Therefore, we creatively and visually see how the Lord deals with His people, the house of Israel. And we can also liken this imagery to our lives today. So, in verse 3, like an actual fruit tree, the house of Israel repeatedly became less fruitful and more wild over time. The people needed the shaping and nourishing influence of the Lord to become productive again. It appears that verse 4 was first fulfilled when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt after 400 years of apostasy and slavery. The elder generation hardened their hearts in the wilderness, so the Lord had to completely prune and destroy them to make room for the younger generation of the family tree to grow. The Lord had to prune the house of Israel on many occasions throughout the Old Testament. He also repeatedly dug around the roots to humble the people. When they were willing, He nourished them by giving them directions and teachings through His prophets. And you know what? The Lord does similar things with us collectively and individually today. Now, just like lopping off a big branch seems very painful, there are times when things we love get cut off, like the death of a loved one, a broken relationship, a lost job, or anything else you lose after having worked so hard to develop it as part of your life. But with proper perspective, we can now refocus our efforts, exercise faith, and bear new fruit. And the Lord of the vineyard knows what he's doing. And the same applies to digging. When the soil's loosened, air, water, and nutrients can get down to the roots to be absorbed. Now, while loosening destroys the surface roots, it forces the tree to send roots deeper into the ground. So when seasons of drought and furious storms hit, and they do, we, along with our children and the church, will be firm and immovable. Surface roots won't help us during our personal storms. Then there's the dung. Now some feel that having the Lord tell them what to do and give them commandments through scripture, at church, and in prayer can be, well, a bit repulsive. But God, the great gardener, needs us to produce good fruit. And while some things can be very hard to hear, if we search the scriptures, have intimate prayer, and really hear God's voice, all with a humble heart, our roots will go deeper, and we'll produce the fruit that'll add so much joy to our lives and others. Finally, there's the grafting, or taking a branch and implanting it into another tree. In verse 8, the Lord prunes off some of the branches and grafts them into similar-sized branches on other trees in the vineyard. When the grafting is successful, the branch grows and produces good fruit, even though it's now connected to a wild tree. This appears analogous to the scattering of Israel, with verse 14 sounding like a perfect description of when the Lord allowed Assyria to carry away the lost ten tribes to other parts of the world in 721 BC. So much of the rest of the chapter is about what happens with a scattering each time the Lord visits. His first visit, during verses 3 to 14, appears to cover mostly Old Testament events. His second visit, from verses 15 to 28, talks about events that happen around the time of Christ and shortly thereafter with the Nephites and Lamanites. Verses 17 and 18 seem like symbolic descriptions of many Gentiles who were adopted into the house of Israel through the missionary labors of the early apostles, like Peter and Paul. Then, in verse 21, the servant notices the Lord had planted one particular tree in a poor spot of ground. The Lord teaches His servant many lessons over the next four verses about how to produce good fruit. He reminds the servant that he knew the ground wasn't ideal, so he'd spent extra care nourishing and taking care of that tree, which led to it producing good fruit. Next, He showed the servant another fruitful tree He'd planted in even worse soil. One of the messages here reflects Jesus' teaching, By their fruits, and not their roots, ye shall know them. 
So a family or an individual can be placed or born in a terrible situation and still become fruitful as long as they respond appropriately to the Lord's nourishing efforts. In verse 25, there's a tree planted in a good spot of ground with partly good fruit and partly bad fruit. It's pretty likely that Jacob and Nephi would have compared this part to their Nephite and Lamanite nations in the Promised Land. And, if that's the case, the missionary efforts in the books of Alma and Helaman are symbolically included in verses 26 to 28. Okay, now it looks like the third visit starts in verse 29 and is the longest section of the allegory, which goes on until verse 59, where the Lord finds a ton of fruit everywhere in the vineyard, but it's all wild. This really sounds like the great apostasy. And because he can't find any good fruit, the Lord of the vineyard weeps, saying, What could I have done more? He then wonders if he should just torch the whole vineyard. But beautifully, the servant pleads with the Lord to spare it a little longer and try one more time to produce good fruit. And the Lord agrees to work in the vineyard one last time. And so begins the final gathering in the latter days. Now it's our turn to work in the vineyard, and verse 72 tells us that the Lord of the vineyard is laboring with us in this effort. You can study verses 60 to 77 to see what the Lord expects of us. As we study this chapter, we must remember that the Lord is a master gardener producing fruit in the house of Israel, the church, your family, and in your own life. Did you know that Living Scripture Streaming kind of like Netflix for LDS families, provides the funds to create these line-upon-line -line cartoons? Every subscription helps make them possible. And did you know, Living Scripture Streaming also has a large library of Hallmark-ish e movies. Yep, just click the Romance channel and you'll find wholesome drama, rom-com, inspirational, and Christmas flicks. There are also great documentaries, including seven seasons of History of the Saints, The Modern Prophets, and hidden in the heartland. It's an amazing video library for all ages. We hope this presentation has helped to bring you a little closer to Jesus Christ. Now it's your turn to study and continue to learn line upon line. So go read your scriptures.